Hosanna and uh, Michael and Anita. Hello. Good, Good morning. morning. Good morning, Revolution. A little bit better. <laughs> so we've had a big week, a lot of things happening. Rosanna, I read this morning that the uh, uh, California has reimposed the COVID web mask wearing. What's going on out there? Well, I guess we're being hit by the Delta virus variant very hard. And uh, I don't think they're able to shut everything down because everyone's out and about. But to try to really make sure that the, you know there's no spread, people wearing their masks. We'll see. Oh. We'll see how. Although you know, a good majority of the people are still wearing their mask, even though everything was lifted. Hmm. It's triple across the country, Anita. The rate wow. people who don't anti-vaxxers, the Republicans, the people who are afraid <laughs> that not getting, and they're the ones getting sick. It doesn't make any sense at all. And, and I know that um, they're saying that, you know, 95 or 98 percent of the people who are hospitalized these days for COVID are people who are not vaccinated or who have maybe other immune problems. So it's really it's ridiculous not to get vaccinated and to encourage what I know at CPAC the other day, they were uh, cheering that the vaccination uh, goal was not set. That just does not make any sense. It's you know, looking towards disease and uh, and uh, just prolonging this pandemic and its its problems uh, beyond where we really need to be. So it's it's just criminal what people are doing with the you know the anti vaxxers Um, so I I think this Delta variant is so um, transmissible that you can just walk past someone who has it and it can be uh, contagious that way. So. Really is that what they're saying? Even That's in the right. open air? Mm -hmm. mm. Very transmissible. That is dangerous. That is dangerous. Mm -hmm. Well, Michael, you were out in the open air yesterday. Y'all held a you held a, a rally on Cuba. How was it? What happened? Why are you rallying? It was very good. I want to remind everyone, we had our masks on at least. I gave an interview mm -hmm. with CNN on behalf of the YCL in New York, and I did have a mask on, so... Uh, we're covered on that front, but it was a rally titled uh, Hands Off Cuba that our young comrades took the initiative on here in New York City. Uh, and we organized with different groups, different campaigns here in the city. It was a broad front coalition effort to end the blockade in Cuba. Not everyone there was a Marxist, not everyone there was a quote unquote radical, but we all agreed that, you know, if you want to help the Cuban people in this time of pandemic and, you know, economic crisis, it's you, you end the blockade. We live here in the United States and that's the only thing we really have control over is pressuring our own government to end this inhumane blockade that has um, been ongoing and continuing for over 60 years now. And so it was a very successful event. You know, the bourgeois media showed up to cover us. Uh, we had about six, 50, 60 people show up, uh, again, from many different organizations. Some people just strolling by and says, what's this? Yeah, you know, I want to be part of the peace process. So it was very great. It was really uh, a success considering it was organized in less than 48 hours. Well, congratulations on the initiative. But why is there, what's going on in Cuba? I mean, why is there this problem of hunger. I mean, there's the blockade. Are there any other things going on? Well, they announced uh, June 1st is when I first read about it in the people's world that, um, you know, they had uh, two vaccines developed in Cuba. Um, one named Abdallah after it's a poem from Jose Marti. Abdallah was a hero who went out and fought uh, the Spanish and they named it after him. You know, he went out and his father greeted him or whatever. And um, so they named it after him, but they had a shortage of syringes due to the blockade. And so they called on the international community to help them with syringes and so forth. And, you know, a lot of people, we, we can't just say everyone in Cuba protesting is a CIA agent. And we can't say everyone out in the streets meeting them as a revolutionary. It's very, it's not black and white. There's a lot of, you know, there's thousands and thousands of apolitical people there, just like there are in any, in any country who they're frustrated with the food shortages, with, you know, not being vaccinated. Uh, yet. And so they take to the streets and they try to, to find a way to direct their anger, you know, and it's not always in the, you know, quote unquote, correct direction. And so there's a lot of forces at play. And of course, the United States is uh, taking advantage of this with everything that's going on in the region concerning Haiti, you know, the president being assassinated there, and so forth. And it really is a shame since Biden, uh, before he was elected, promised to go back to the Obama era, you know, kind of, it was more neutral, more lenient policy regarding Cuba. That hasn't happened yet. And so we really have to push for that. 
uh, in this next period. Well, uh, Rosanna, the Communist Party, uh, Biden and them said they were going to reset the relation. We're going to have a reset. I haven't seen the reset yet. We, we have to push them harder, don't you think, to step most, up? I mean, this Most this definitely. It's, it's the humane thing to do. How can you deny people vaccinations? How can you deny people uh, food? It's, it's really, we have to look at it as the most humane thing to do. Although, you know, imperialist powers see this as an opportunity to create this unrest that where they can use as an excuse to go in and, and uh, create more un unrest. It's, you know, it goes back to the battle of ideas and, you, you know, taking advantage of people's situations and trying to blame uh, the government or blame somebody that, that, that it's not playing their, their game. Mm -hmm. Cuba has, for the last, uh, since the revolution, we've been making significant strides in education, in health care, uh, in uh, international solidarity, and in improving the lives and education of their people, wiping out illiteracy, Anita. Uh, right. But the blockade is just choking them, just choking them slowly and penalizing countries for assisting them. And, and uh, so, and and Biden and them got it wrong. They, they they have to back up, and but in order to get them to back up, we have to force them, and that's one of the big problems. Developing that you know movement for you know just normal state to state relations with uh, every country on the planet. Mm -hmm. Exactly, it's it's normal. Uh, I think people don't really realize how draconian that, uh, that um, blockade is. If a ship goes to Cuba and lands in one of the trading places there, it can't even touch U.S. soil for 180 days. So it's, you know, nobody is inclined to, to, uh, to trade with uh, Cuba because of those issues. So it costs so much more in shipping costs to get anything imported. They just need a normal trade relationship with the rest of the world. And, and the US blockade has stopped that for 60 years or more. And there's also a count, I think what's influencing Biden, unfortunately, is this counter uh, protest in, uh, in Florida. Uh, there's a lot of rallying up of the Cuban um, anti-socialist um, uh, folks in, in uh, Dade, uh, Miami-Dade County area. They had a huge protest there where they blocked a street, which is exactly what was in DeSantis's last anti-protest bill. But those folks did not get arrested. Uh, the, uh, the, the bill, the anti-protest bill was not brought to bear on this particular protest. So it, it just goes to prove the hypocrisy of, of the DeSantis uh, regulations against protest and um and it just doesn't i it's it's doesn't uh it's not uh looking good for um the real battle of ideas being won in the in the south florida area which i think is important to biden winning florida in the in the future so i think that's something we have to look out for i noticed also last week that there were protests around food and delivery and healthcare and uh, all of these issues in South Africa. Uh, they were uh, started off in, in KwaZulu-Natal and in Durban. Uh, people were upset that uh, Mr. Zuma turned himself in. Uh, and uh, but then all across the country for, in Houghton and in, and in KwaZulu protests, burning of cars and trucks and they even destroyed a blood bank and the coordinated uh, activities. Uh, and uh, I, I just wonder, is that a, a coincidence? Cuba, one day, uh, you know, socialist government, South Africa, uh, next day, kind of a left center social democratic government led by the ANC and coalition with the you know, I just wonder, Michael, if this is some kind of international coordination, uh, or maybe it's coincidental. I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist, but uh, it just seems like a mighty odd coincidence, no? 
Well, I don't think it's a coincidence that, I mean, even in the, the bourgeois media, I, I, I can remember New York Times and Washington Post headlines praising the uh, Cuban response to the pandemic, the Vietnamese response, and I believe the communist response in Kerala, India. And so, you know, those are headlines that we all saw. We all read about that. And so I think they, the international, you know, monopoly capitalists, you know, they have to counter that. They have to counter all that good news about socialism with, you know, oh, see, they're not doing so hot now. And so, you know, I'm not surprised at all. It's just a shame that, um, again, you know, the United States and its allies take advantage of, of, you know, people suffering to try to get, you know, what they, you know, the regime change out of it. It's just, and that was kind of the, the line that we were trying to, to put out to people yesterday. It doesn't, you don't have to be a communist to care about Cuba. You just have to be human, you know? Uh, you don't have to be um, a member of the ANC to care about people in South Africa. You know, it's about saving lives. And so as political as it is, you know, imperialism, the blockade, the pandemic, it's about saving lives, you know. Well, it looks like lives of color are less important than, than, than lives of a, a lighter youth. I, I saw this morning that only 1% of the population on the African continent has COVID vaccines available to them. Mm. Uh, you know, Anita, it's, it's uh, I mean, you know, it's, yeah. it's uh, vaccine apartheid seems to mm -hmm. be a continuing problem. The greed of the pharmaceutical companies not to, not to share the technology and have that technology transfer that would enable other places to make their own vaccines. Uh, seems uh, really especially cruel um, to, to withhold it from them. And I would point out that in contrast, the contrast between South Africa demonstrations and Cuban is that I think in Cuba, there was apparently one person killed in demonstrations and in South Africa, how many? A hundred or more? Um, it's, uh, you know, it's much more, a more dangerous situation uh, there, I think. Yeah, much more. And of course, a lot of them were killed in the course of uh, stampedes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, this problem in the developing world is just, uh, you know, and uh, inequality and, 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 and the poverty. Uh, uh, and just look at what happened in Haiti. You know, we were talking about that last week. Uh, and there were the Colombians were involved and uh, some doctor from the United States and Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it sounds like something out of a movie. I wonder if it was drug related or gangsterism related. It's just, it's just crazy. But anyway, we got enough problems stateside. Mm -hmm. Voter suppression. Uh, voter suppression is out of control. Their, their Republicans have bills in how many states? They passed one in Texas. Uh, Rosanna, did you read about that? The legislature and the Democrats have uh, moved to, they, they, they fled Texas, they went to Washington, D.C. Now they have arrest warrants issued against them and uh, trying to stop the Republicans from passing even more onerous voter suppression bills. I, th I think it was a good move by the Republic, by the Democrats, you know, it shows yeah. some backbone. And I think that that's the, <clears throat> that's what the Democrats need to do is use whatever is to their advantage. And uh, they, the, their advantage was to not allow a quorum so that these things could not be put forth. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's a good, it's a good step. I didn't know that there was arrest warrants for them, uh, but I think that that's what needs to be done. We have to stop this, you know, voter suppression. Apparently, you know, many people thought voting didn't matter, but it sure does matter because there's such a fight. So, uh, you know, we have to be out there to vote. If these voters, I feel that if uh, these uh, bills and stuff are passed, then it's up to us who can actually go out and vote to make sure we do go out and vote. That's one step that we need to do is to make sure we get everybody else that has, you know, has a car, has water, stuff like that, that they're, you know, using um, to go out and vote uh, because we're, this is a big fight that may not be um, 
won before the 2022 elections. I read that the head of the Black Caucus got arrested yesterday protesting the voting rights. Mm -hmm. Michael, when are you going to get arrested? You, Anita, you ready to get arrested? Uh, uh, no, I was just saying that's my congressman, Joyce Beatty. So, uh, mm. yep. She got pepper sprayed last summer at one of the that's Black Lives right. Matter. Yep. So, yeah. yeah history. <laughs> but well, the, the Poor People's Campaign, Rosanna, is leading that fight. That's, that's quite a movement that's going on there. Yes. And, uh, we have to join it and 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 be a and be a part of it. Um, uh, your congresswoman, uh, uh, she's the head of the Black Caucus, Anita. That's right, Joyce Beatty. And uh, there's one thing that I wanted to say about uh, Texas and their uh, uh, voting rules. You know, Texas is the it's the hardest state to vote in. You can you can get in all kinds of criminal penalties if you do something wrong. For instance, a woman voted in uh, 2016, a black woman, and she was arrested and given a five year sentence because she uh, filed a provisional ballot in 2016. She didn't realize she wasn't eligible yet to vote. She was on parole. Um, and she's uh, been sentenced to five years. Right now she's out trying to fight that, but um, that's just, uh, and the, the new, that's under the old regulations for Texas voting. So these new regulations criminalize even more mistakes that you could make. And uh, they're really um, just uh, um, made to, 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 uh, to suppress uh, black and brown voters and uh, in a state that we keep talking about going, going blue eventually in the next you know, four or eight years. So I think uh, that's why they really um, zeroed in on Texas in particular. Oh my goodness. And, 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 and you know, it's not just voter suppression. They, they, in several states around the country, they're, they're also putting together repressive packages aimed at kind of, you know, registering and scaring people, Michael. What's going on in Florida with the uh, efforts to force, uh, require students to register their political views with the state government. Is that really true? Well, it started with teachers. You know, we're going to do loyalty pledges to make sure the teachers aren't teaching socialism, you know, which, God, that's, doesn't that sound like McCarthyism? Te you know, advo teaching the advocation of revolution by force of violence, the overthrow of the government. So it started as that. Now it's with the students making sure that they take it like a it's not so much they don't call it a pledge with the students but a political t evaluation to see where they lean um and i i went to high school here in the united states and we had something similar but it was kind of like a project you know are you a republican or a democrat liberal or conservative so it could be you know put forward in that kind of way uh to make sure that none of the kids are too radical make sure you know none of them care too much about poor people or ending war or anything um, but it is a violation of democratic rights. It's no one's business, you know, whatever someone's political or religious beliefs are, of course. And so, you know, you, you have to ask yourself, um, wh where do they draw the limit? Is there going to be a limit? And I'm sure this will be brought up uh, as well as with the, the, the demand from teachers to, you know, not teach socialism. I think they'll both be challenged in court. I think there's already some of that on the table. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, well, I mean, I, I just think that, you know, schools are supposed to be a place for free exchange of ideas, you know, and you're supposed to be able to debate and think critically. And, and now, you know, um, and this Governor DeSantis, they say he, he's becoming the most popular Republican, the, the possible successor of Trump. I mean, I, Unbelievable. I just don't know which way this country is going to go. And I, I've been reading, Rosanna, about the uh, uh, head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, what was it? Mattis. Millie. Uh, I'm sorry. My, uh, Millie. What, Millie. Millie, I'm sorry. I, you start with an M, I get confused. <laughs> and he was... Uh, talking during the uh, December uh, days that he felt that Trump was going to stage a coup d'etat. 
And some, and some people said, oh, you guys in the Communist Party are being hysterical. <laughs> well, we were, we were right. That's right. We were. We were, we were, we were right. right. The good thing is we that right. they, I, I think the positive thing was that they uh, were very conscious of saying they were not going to get involved, that it was yeah. not the military's position to do those kinds of things or role. Uh, for me, I thought that was, you know, positive and comforting, so to speak, because, you know, it's true that in many other countries, the, you know, the coup is successful because the military is behind it. So I thought that that was at least, you know, it's hopeful in some way. You know, any step is, you know, any good step is a good, you know, positive step is a good step. Democracy, bourgeois democracy has to be defended at every single step, you know, and, and uh, not to do so is to encourage the development of and the danger that came really close to the edge of a fascist uh, a takeover. Uh, it's a really complicated picture that we're dealing with and we, we need the broadest possible, but also the deepest possible unity to, to uh, combat it. Well, I think that does it for this week. Do we got any uh, programs coming up? Any uh, uh, webinars tomorrow? There's yes. a webinar on the trade union movement, no? Right. It's the Is book that by, with uh, uh, Denise William Weinbrenner and John Case? That's right. Y'all heard of William Z. Foster? Yep. Tomorrow, go to our website, check it out. There's going to be an important webinar detailing Foster's contribution to trade union strategy and tactics. And that, well, uh, Joe, that's a perfect way to start off the week of action on the PRO Act, uh, which is this absolutely. Week. Absolutely. Well, see you next week. Uh, meanwhile, stay strong, stay safe. Wear your mask if you need to. Be careful out there. Get your vaccine if you haven't gotten it. You know, we need you. And uh, stay in the fight. See you next week. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.